is trying to go live. Live now. Here we go. Falcha, good evening, friends. How are we all? I hope everybody's keeping safe and well. Welcome along to Live Irish Myths. We call this Mythflix. <laughs> That's its nickname. Live Irish Myths, episode 74. Shachto is a kiahar. I'm Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. You're all very welcome along to the Mythical Ireland Library stroke office stroke headquarters aligned precisely with drone henge and the stone of divisions in uh, ishnock tonight we're talking about newgrange in the first of a number of episodes about newgrange uh, we've had episodes about newgrange but there's a series coming up so just to let you know we're going to be discussing newgrange as a monument tonight what i'm not really going to be going into tonight is the modern uh um excavation and restoration and uh, conservation of Newgrange. So we'll be doing that in a separate episode. So I'll kind of not, it's not that I'm trying to avoid it. It's just, we're not do necessarily doing it tonight. I'm going to pull the blind down. The sun is thankfully shining very brightly. Good evening to you all on YouTube. Stephen Wardley says he would love to visit Newgrange. It's on his list to do. And hopefully you'll get the opportunity, Stephen. Daisy Peters is watching from Rio de Janeiro where it's raining, believe it or not. Well, it's been a fabulous, sunny, warm day here in Ireland. Tashe Che. It is hot and it is beautiful. Uh, who else? Mandy McCurl says, hello, everyone, and hope you're staying well. Beautiful filtered sunshine and sparkling water this evening on the Isle of Mull in the Hebrides. Sounds lovely, Mandy. Uh, and uh, long time no talk. <laughs> Jackie Stevenson says, hello, Anthony and the Tua. Another warm and sunny day in Southern California. Brilliant. River all, sorry, River says, hello, all. Missed the last couple Love lives, but glad to make it today. And we're really glad to have you along, River. Welcome. And on Facebook, loads and loads. Aaron Durrett is watching. Gia Glitch, Alex Casterton says hello, Anthony. And to us, Launcher, Alex Mary Cloran says good evening, everyone. Banachti Mary, Todd Desper says good evening, Anthony and Tua. Shanonua, uh, Todd Camilla Reland is watching. Hello, Camilla. Falcha, you're welcome along. Desiree Riley is watching. Hello, Desiree. Serena Swift says hello, all. Gia Glitch, Serena. Margaret Ring says, good evening, Anthony, and the lovely Tua. So I was sitting uh, today and uh, sitting down to say, oh, what am I going to do an episode on today? And please, it has to be something that doesn't involve research because I just didn't have the time. I was doing domestic chores and all sorts of stuff today. Um, so Margaret, uh, I was chatting to Margaret, and Margaret said, why don't you do something about how you came to write your Newgrange book? I was like, brilliant, fabulous suggestion. Thank you for your inspiration, Margaret. And, of course, for your support as... Uh, a, a co-admin on the Mythical Ireland community group. Nick Eska Casterton says, hello, Anthony and the Tua. Hope you all had a lovely day. Beautiful day so far, Nick. Falcha. Jim Conway says, Jim Conway, Ard Vacha. Conas to to Jim. You're very welcome along. Ralph Waldron. Don Green, Egg Totnev in Alt League in you. In Ath League, it is sunny today and it's delightful, isn't it, Ralph? Steve Martinson says, Good afternoon slash evening slash morning, Anthony and the Mythflix clan. Blessings to all. Banachti Ort, Steve. Barbara Kling says, hello, everyone from sunny Vermont. Sun is shining in a lot of places today, except Rio de Janeiro. But Daisy, don't worry. It'll help the grass grow. Debbie Daly says, hi, Anthony and the Tua family. Gia Glitch, Debbie. Kathy May Dayo says, good evening, Mr. Anthony and all Tua. My, my today, do Tua, do my today in... Newcastle, Washington State, USA. I'm excited about tonight. Well, hopefully we can uh, live up to the billing then. Uh, Falcha Anthony says, Aaron, uh, in the mythical Bat Cave, hail the Tua. All hail the Tua. Hello, Aaron. Good evening to you with your lovely Irish name. Scott Gracie says, good evening, Anthony and Mythflix Tua. Hope you're all well and happy, Scott. Thank you very much. And uh, it's lovely for you to drop in on us this evening. And it's great to have you. Long T Menosi says, good evening, Anthony and fellow Tua. Falcha Long T Sheena McGonagall says, Super Ruben is doing a project on Newgrange. She's delighted. Falcha, Sheena, August Ruben. Desiree Riley says, good evening, Anthony, and the rest of the Tua. Tranonoa, Desiree. Jules Cousins says, hi, Falcha, Jules. Jerry Andrade says, hello, Anthony, from Merseyside. Jigic, Jerry, how are you doing? <laughs> terrible, terrible Merseyside accent. Never mind. Patricia McAteer is watching. Hello, Patricia. Sharon Boggins Stitch says hello, Anthony, and the two are greetings from a very hot Reading in California. We're delighted here that the weather is nice in California. Nora Gaffney O'Connor says, Hey, Anthony, C was fab. Yeah, I'm sure it was, Nora. Fantastic. Freya Shawholm says, Trononoa Antonagas Tua. Love and blessings from a rainy Sweden. It's not sunny everywhere, but you never know. 
what will come tomorrow? J Jerry Andrade says, coming in the autumn. Brilliant. Doris O'Hara says, good evening, Anthony. And everyone, Gia Glitch, Doris. Michael Naylor says, hello from Mike and Jeanette, and they're in Princeton, New Jersey. Always a great delight to have you guys along. Pat Rowan is watching. Falls you, Pat. Gia Glitch. Susan, Susan Scott says, Hello from Northwest Connecticut again. Gorgeous day, gorgeous skies. In the studio, listening and painting again. Fantastic. There's this just massive buzz of creativity around Netflix, which really heartens me. It really delights me. I've been writing a book. Um, not taking so much photographs these days, but that doesn't matter. I've been writing a book. People have been painting. People have been forging Tom. Uh, and he's there. Uh, people have been creating all sorts of artworks, and it's wonderful. Tom King says, good evening, Anthony. Uh, speak of the, uh, couldn't call him a devil. Speak of the mead, man. Yes, yes, I, I had to be careful there. Living in mead, but originally from mead as well. Good evening, Anthony, and all the two. I hope all in good form, all in great form, Tom. Thanks for asking. Kristen Gray Taggart says, "Bean, California. Hi from Kristen and Scott. Enjoying a sunny day in the north. Falcher, Kristen, and... Uh, Scott. Jack Durkin says hi everyone. Fall to Jack. How are you? Melissa Glassman says hello from Connecticut. Gia Gitch. John Michael King says hello from the UK. Not long back from County Mayo. Banach T. John. Fall to. Todd Despera says I would love to visit Newgrange someday. Hopefully you'll get the chance. Camilla Rellan says Newgrange my favourite. Good evening all. And of course Camilla has been to Newgrange because I've seen her photos. Brilliant stuff, Camilla. Jessica Walter Woods says, good evening from the Monaster Boyce Woods family. Wow, they're on here just after finishing a fab barbecue dinner in the sunshine. All settling in to listen tonight. Brilliant. So you're not on the old, uh, Office Care 365 or whatever it is on YouTube tonight. Brilliant to see you anyway. Uh, on Facebook, Gwen Laffin says hello from New Jersey, in USA. Lovely part of the world. We were there last November. Catherine Woodruff says hello if the spiral represents the sun cycle in one year, could the triple spiral in Newgrange represent three consecutive years? Yes, it could. It could. Does it, though? Is that what it's about? Who knows? Pat Rowan says, hello, Anthony and Tua. Fall to Pat. Paul Garron says, good evening, Tua. Go lair. Polo Ratto. Fall to Paul in Ratto, Thin County Mead. Come on me. Marcia Montiero says, hello from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Fall to second viewer from Rio tonight. Marcia, lovely to have you along. Lindsay O'Brien is in Chicago where it's hot and sunny, which seems to be the main theme apart from those couple of places where it's raining. Megan Walter says, sunny and warm in Mississippi. Hello, Megan. Fall to Alwyn Roy Badziak. Good evening, Anthony and Tua. I think it's Sunday. Hard to be sure these days. Yes, indeed. Uh, the calendar sort of all the days. It, you know, the the, re, the regime has changed a little bit, the schedule. And uh, I'm working from home every day. So uh, I know it's Sunday because I have to work tomorrow. Kathy Maydeo, sorry, I meant to say it's sunny today in Newcastle, Washington State. Ah, okay. Uh, very nice. Mariana Dunn says, happy Sunday, dear. Mythflix, Tua and Anthony, happy to join. Happy to have you here, Mariana. Marta Lopez Garcia, hi, good evening, uh, Anthony and everyone. Watching from Spain, Falche, uh, Marta, you're very welcome along. De Vasconcelos says, greetings from sunny Brazil. Another watcher from Brazil. Falche. Very good evening to you. Marcia Monteiro says, say hello, Rio de Janeiro, where it's apparently raining, according to one of my Rio sources. Barbara Barney says, hi, Anthony Giagic. Yvette Tillema says, good afternoon to us. Thanks again, Mr. Murphy. Been looking forward to this all day. Well, I hope we can whet your appetite. Uh, Vicky Leeds. Kibby says hello from Michigan in the USA. Hello, Vicky Falcha. Anne McCallum said visited Newgrange last time I was in Ireland. Uh, it was a couple of years ago during the mighty double storms when Ireland came to a total shutdown. Was brilliantly stuck in Ireland for extra days because no planes flying. <laughs> ah, yes, you were a prisoner of fortune. A lot of angry faces coming up on the screen. What's that about? Cheers from Michigan, says Linda Ryan Falcha. Gia Gritch. Paula Farrell says, hi from County Down, Anthony. Falcha, Paula, welcome. Michael, Mike Athy says, greetings from Pittsburgh. Falcha, Mike. Matthew Bessel says, slauncha from Gay Kels, Planet Wide. Bless your work. Banachti, Matthew, welcome along. Okay. Maybe I'll find out what all the angry faces are about in a moment. But it's very unusual for us to have angry faces on Mythflix. Bunny Thompson says, hey, y'all, from Anniston, Alabama. Hello, Bunny. Falcha. Trenonawa. 
Samantha Josephine White says, good evening from Germany. Giagrich, Samantha. Paula Farrell Miller says, someday I hope to visit. We would love to see you here, Maura. Michael Marr is watching. Hello, Michael. Connus Ata too. They're going to need a crane to get me out of my house, says Megan. <laughs> Sharon Disney says, Hi, Ireland. Falsha Sharon. Sirsha Nichandel says, Kade Maratatu, Anthony. A Tomuj on shut in Dallas. 31 Celsius. Feels like 37. It's Bralon, Bruna Bonia, August. The podcast, Chin. Well, thank you, Sirsha. And it's lovely and warm in Dallas. And and you like Bruna Bonia and my podcast. Well, it's very nice of you to say so. Falsha. Laurie Normoyle Blanchard says, Tara, good. Lloyd Stilwell says, hello. And I say, Gia Gooch, Lloyd. Fulcha. Jennifer Foley says, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening to you, Jennifer. Barb Jordan says, hello, everyone. Gia Gooch, Barb, good to see you again. Trina Neerk, Gia Gooch from Germany to all the lovely people. Hello, indeed, Trina. Hello, James, says James Williams. Fulcha, Achemus, Connors Atatu. Pamela Mulready says, Howdy from Melbourne. Now, it has to be ridiculous o'clock in Melbourne. It's either 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. in Melbourne. Brilliant stuff. Thank you for joining us, Pamela. And for Maybe maybe you can't sleep or something, but it's nice to have you here all the same. Kelly Wood, Wood, Woodward Cook says, Hello from a finally warm Toronto, Canada. Snow two weeks ago, 40 degrees next week. Brilliant stuff. Karen Gogus is in the house. Falcha Karen Macharja, or as I call you, Kivin O'Gogon. It's nice to have you along. Edina Sparks says, good afternoon all. Looking forward to today's episode. And it's nice to have you in the house. Patricia McAteer says, good evening all. Beautiful day. Cold and rainy in Minnesota, says April Chang. Hopefully it'll warm up soon. Matthew Bessel, have you done any presentation on Cape Clear Island? I haven't. And I've been there. I'm not sure I'd have enough for a whole episode. I know there's uh, standing stones, and I know there's megalithic art that was it moved from there. I think it's in the National Museum, isn't it? Hang on, can I just adjust this? Make sure I tighten it nice and tight. Thanks for the... Maybe we could do um, a, com a combination. Cape Clear Island. Well, I'll put it down anyway, uh, Matthew, as a suggestion. And maybe I'd combine it with other islands. Uh, Bernie Courtney says, good evening to you all from Castle Bar. Not as exotic as Rio, but I'm sure if the weather is nice, Bernie, it's probably one of the nicest places in the world. Laura O'Reilly says, hello, everyone. Lovely day here in Madrid. Not too hot yet. Missing home, though. Ah, hopefully you'll get a chance to get home uh, before too long, Laura. Maura Farrell Miller says, love to the Farrell clan. Banachti, good na farrells. <laughs> Kathy Maydayo says, welcome to all the new tour uh, indeed. Scott Gracie says, a sunny, happy Sunday. Yes, I don't know why the angry faces come up. Maybe somebody's spamming us. But anyway, we're not an angry cr crowd. We're a friendly, warm crowd. Anne Garrity Smith says, hi from Brele. Hello, Anne. Hope you're keeping well. Haven't been talking to you in a while. And Ardra Doherty is in New Jersey in the USA. Quite a good representation today from New Jersey. Um, I think it's overtaken the West Coasters, the Californians and the uh, Washington Staters this evening, maybe. Cucullan Butch says Scott Taggart. And right back at you, Scott. John McGovern is watching. Hello, John. One of our local viewers here in Vojadoha. Uh, greetings from the Noonan clan, says Matthew Bessel. Jervis O'Coin says, Shevor Maha Acharja O Dubai. Nice. I'd say it's warm there, and I wouldn't say it's raining either. Maria Rodriguez Doyle says, I'm Maria, living in Spain, but I am from Wexford. Tranonawa, Maria, you're welcome. Linda Jacobs Hanley is in hot Atlanta. Toshe Che in you in Atlanta. Uh, very nice to have you along, Linda. Liz Curry says, hi, everyone from Perth, Western Australia. Having the storm of a decade here. It's crazy weather. Liz, it, what time is it there? It has to be something like two or three o'clock in the morning. Oh, lots of love hearts coming up now. You see, we're balancing out whoever it was who was spamming the angry faces button. You, you've been outvoted. I see your angry face and I raise you a thousand love hearts. Banach thee from all the two. Amber's Circle says hi from Vegas. Falcha, Amber's. Vicky Wallace Southall says hello, my lovely friends from a sunny day in Oregon. Falcha, Vicky. And if Evan is with you, hello to Evan as well. Catherine Griffin says hello from Alabama, Gia Gritch. Rowan Grove says hello, a little late from cool, cloudy Colorado. 
We're expecting rain showers this afternoon. And of course, I've been gardening. Well, brilliant, an opportunity for the plants to grow. Gerald says, uh, Jerry from Jacksonville in Florida. Fall to Gerald or Jerry. Nice to have you along. Laura Adoma Troy says, an evening with mythical touch. Longing for your story. Good evening, Laura. Nice to see you again. Of course, Laura is in Blessington in County Wicklow. Burr Whelan says, hello from sunny Dublin. I love Newgrange. What's not to love about it, Burr? Except for at the moment, it's closed. Griselda Can Musset says, hello from Kent in the UK. Fall check, Griselda. You're welcome along to Live Irish Myths. Ridiculous o'clock, yeah. <laughs> Mario Stepanovich is watching. Now, he definitely, definitely takes uh, the closest viewer uh, prize tonight because do you know where he lives? He lives two doors away. If I... <laughs> If I do that, I can see out the window and I can see his house. Mario, what a great uh, uh, pleasure to have you along uh, this evening. Mairead Gorman is watching. Hello, Mairead. Come as a thought to. Kimberly Fields Sipola is in Washington. Oh, the Washingtoners are starting. Is that Washington, D.C.? That is Washington State, undoubtedly. But uh, So the Washington Washingtoners are starting to balance everything up. Jack says it's 4 a.m. in Melbourne. See, I told you it was ridiculous o'clock. Kathy Flint Joy says greetings from Surfside Beach in South Carolina. Good evening, Kathy. Trononawa. Scott Taggart says, uh, how about an episode, an episode on the Down Patrick area? Mm. Uh, yes, probably lots of stuff there, including Patrick himself. But uh, I would have to do some research and digging on that. But anyway, thanks. I'll put it on the list, definitely. Evan is here, brought two Pokemon with him to listen. Hello, Evan and the Pokemon. Dean T says rainbows and toes. Toes, Tony. Toes, T-A-U-S. I don't know what that is, Dean. Maybe you will explain. Daniel Williams says help from New Jersey here. Daniel, it's nice to have your help. <laughs> we're lousy with friendliness, says Megan. No, we're not. We're just crowd the place with friendliness. Uh, Tia Marie Grady Massey says, love watching from Dallas, Texas. Good evening to you, Tia Marie. Debbie Daly, have you discussed Blemies and other headless mythical creatures? No. And again, that's one that would have to sort of, you know, be very well researched first. So mm, let me see. Headless, headless creatures. Mm. Debbie Daly. On the list, Dean T in Maryland, Scott Tiger, no West Coast. The best is the best coast. Well, I'm not arguing with that. I don't live there. <laughs> and uh, Margaret was the one who prompted the love button. Good stuff. Jennifer Ho says aloha, aloha from another island, Hawaii. We're much in common, green and alive, with more than meets the eye. Jennifer, a very good morning to you. It is evening time here in Ireland, but it's great to have you along. It's a great pleasure. Hi all from Tucson, Arizona, says Barbara Murphy. Another Murphy enters the Murphy household. Falsha, Barbara, McCarja. Uh, Eva Anderson says, good evening, everybody. Rainy day here in Western Sweden, but it is much needed indeed. Erica Bow says, good afternoon, Falsha, to you both. Robin Edgar, I've noticed streams of angry emoticons during Mythflix in the past. Not sure what it's about. It's probably just one troll repeated ignore and they will go away don't feed them yes i shouldn't have mentioned it at all P penny sidoli says it's a cloudless warm day in santa barbara glad to hear that penny welcome along long team men says i bought a copy of island of the setting sun from amazon nigeria for just fifteen hundred dollars a snip at half the price not bad is it a signed copy Work twice if it's signed. Louise Sherrill says, hi, Giagic. What time are we on? Oh, we're 19. We better get moving. Flowers, everything on deck today and in front, says Dean T. Brilliant. Laura A Edgerton says, we're in Cork. Owen and Laura, fault you. Scott Taggart says, West Coast. Anita Foss, Hi Heidi Ho from Norway, fault you. Anita Giagic. Megan says she's baking bread as we speak. Now, listen, is there enough to share around? And and will it be stale when it arrives? <laughs> uh, brilliant. 
Uh, Scott Tiger says, and Aussies at O'Dark 30. It certainly is uh, very early in the morning for the Australian viewers. Hopefully you can stay awake and I won't put you to sleep again. Liz Christie says, greetings from Annie Alla in, Ca in County Monaghan in Ireland. Fault you, Liz. You're welcome along. Okay, I have to move on. Had to abandon YouTube, but still here in the chat. Uh, damn Fomorian gremlins, says Aaron Durrett. Stick with it, uh, Aaron. It'll it'll sort itself out. Michelle, Michelle Lorcher says, hello from Utah. Falchi, Michelle. And apologies for butchering your the pronunciation of your name. Francis Smith says, I all. And Francis is in Slane in County Mead. Hello, Francis. Okay, greetings from Salem, Massachusetts, says Hawthorne Rawlings. Good evening, Hawthorne. Nice to have you along. Someone says, hi, Coda. They did hear embarking, yes. Ballynow Circle near Down Patrick Anthony, Paula Farrell. Uh, Ballynow. Okay, thank you for that. Teresina Fitzpatrick says, hi from Mayo, and hi right back to you from Condailu. Laura Puente says, hi, excited for today's program. Fault you, Laura. Liz Curry, okay. Evening, Anthony, says Mello Nello. Hi, Neil. How are you? Okay, I really need to get moving. Okay, good, good. John Mean is in the house from San Francisco. Hello, John. Uh, Sandrine Brady. Bonsoir to le monde. Anthony, I moved to the garden tonight. Lovely evening in Orleans in France. Bonsoir, mon ami. Kujam mm. Razalgetti says, uh, well, he's talking to somebody else, but he's there, and it's good to see you. Vera Nadine Bowen says, sending everyone cool, sunny breezes from Nova Scotia. Falsha, Vera. Okay, I'm up to date. I'm up to date. Folks, it may be that um, you're going to hear it from the YouTubers, says Todd. Yes, I will tell them to skip forward to 22 minutes. Okay. If they want to skip, that's all right. Tonight, we're talking about Newgrange. We're talking specifically about... Newgrange Monument to Immortality, uh, the first of probably a number of readings from this work. Uh, you might recognize the author. His name is Anthony Murphy. John Walsh is watching. Hello, John Falcher. How are you keeping? I hope you're uh, not uh, gone totally nuts in the lockdown. Uh, I hope you're not suffering too badly from uh, cabin fever. Uh, and so um, Margaret was encouraging me, Margaret Ring was encouraging me to perhaps talk a little bit about, you know, how and why I wrote the book. And uh, uh, back in, uh, it was published in 2012, and, and it's been reprinted since. Um, the publisher in Liffey Press would have been saying, of course, the first thing a publisher always says to an author of a work is, you know, what else is there on the market that this will compete with? Uh, is there much, uh, you know, and, and make a judgment call around that. And if you're in a crowded market, it's more difficult to get uh, a book deal. So the, the honest answer was there's loads and loads of books about Newgrange. In fact, I've always said um, that if you had told me when I was a teenager or a young adult, you know, that you're going to write books about Newgrange, I've often said this, you know, uh, my answer would have been, well, there's no need for me to write books about Newgrange because all the experts uh, have already written books about Newgrange, the archaeologists and the artists and the uh, mytho mythologists and, you know, even the astronomers and Martin Brennan and et al., you know, that it had all been written down and there was no need for any more books so I would have thought. Um, but when it came round to it, uh, having published Island of the Setting Sun in 2006 and expanded that for a, a reprint in 2008, uh, and don't forget there's going to be a 2020 edition coming soon, um, I had felt always that it was a very difficult job to fit everything into Island of the Setting Sun because it was a very comprehensive thesis dealing with, you know, archaeology, astronomy and mythology, as I say, stars, stones and stories. And I always felt that the Newgrange section, although Newgrange occupies two chapters in Island of the Setting Sun, where everything else only occupies one chapter, uh, it was still a, a difficult job to compress everything in. So I felt that Newgrange, from that point, Newgrange always had deserved a bigger publication. But I suppose the a bigger motivating factor in the whole thing was the fact that, yes, an awful lot of books had been written and published about Newgrange, and not always specific to Newgrange, but, 
you know, on a broader theme, the archaeology of Brunibonia, the great monuments of New Grange and Out and Douth, and the mythology of same. Um, it struck me that uh, no nobody had, I think, successfully managed to explore it in depth in terms of the heart and soul of it. Uh, yes, uh, all the factual stuff had been covered, uh, all the... Um, uh, you know, the uh, the exact science stuff, you know, the archaeology and the dating and the sizes and everything that could be described had been described, the sizes, the dimensions, the types of stone used, uh, you know, and even information about, you know, the bones that were buried there, the people who might have built it, how long it might have taken them to build it, where they came from, what other monuments are associated with it. Helen Guinan is in the house, Your Majesty, um, but um, it was my view that there was a deeper story to be told. Um, so there was a, a spiritual aspect and a mythological aspect that I felt, well, certainly if you've read archaeological works about Newgrange, you will, you will have seen that, that quite a lot they, they avoid dealing with the mythical traditions uh, the mythological traditions of Newgrange. In fairness to Michael O'Kelly, uh, he actually had a chapter in his book, early on in the book, about the old traditions of Newgrange, so had covered some of that. Um, Frank Fogarty is watching Falch of Crunches, um, I felt that, personally, there was something, uh, a deeper work there to be done. Uh, as I say, exploring the mythical side, exploring the spiritual side, exploring the deeper meaning of it, exploring the relevance of these great ancient monuments to today. Now, uh, that uh, was, it is a subjective work. Uh, there's no point in, in trying to tell you uh, that my Newgrange book is, is an entirely objective work. It's not an objective work. It's a subjective work. But I'm writing it from the point of view of an artist rather than a scientist, uh, but all the time, of course, paying attention to uh, the science and the the data and the information that we have about Newgrange, not trying to undermine that in any way. You'll have to forgive me. I was out for a walk a couple of hours ago with my son, and uh, there must be a lot of pollen in the air because my nose has been running ever since. <laughs> I do apologize. <laughs> And of course, I will do all that off camera. Vonnie McWilliams is watching. Good evening to you, Vonnie. Uh, and so also uh, in 2012, uh, for the first time since I left school, uh, and I left school in 1991, <laughs> uh, beginning to show my age, uh, I actually was unemployed for a time in 2012. Uh, the economy of Ireland and, of course, other countries, but Ireland was very badly affected, had collapsed uh, beginning in and around 2007, really 2008, when it started all going downhill. And by 2012, it had been dragging on for four or five years, and a lot of people uh, were in negative equity with their mortgages. People couldn't afford their mortgages. People were losing their homes, mass unemployment, mass migration, emigration. A lot of people were leaving the country. Hi, uh, hi uh, Vonnie. Uh, and so there was another story there to be told, which was that all of these sites I had felt and noticed and speaking to other people and friends and, and tour guides and people in the hospitality industry, that there was a change in, in attitude towards prehistoric sites uh, and sacred sites, as it were. People were beginning to see them uh, for the sacredness of them uh, and less for the, for the tourism uh, aspect of them, if that makes any sense. It was as if to me that following the the economic and political and religious collapse, because there were three things that sort of happened in tandem with each other, the church collapsed as well. And that wasn't directly related to the uh, uh, the collapse of the economy. That was re related more directly to the scandals of the church, uh, in particular the 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 uh, the paedophile scandals. Uh, and so there was a movement away from the church, then the economy collapsed, and then politics as we knew it in Ireland uh, was was mainly divided between two parties, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, since the War of Independence in the 1920s. And all of a sudden, um, because it was felt that the uh, 
political parties had a huge part to play in the collapse of the economy. There was great anger and great resentment and, and, and great disillusion around politics as well. And I just felt that a lot of people were reaching out for this earlier stuff, this pre-Christian, uh, not just the sites, but the myth mythology behind them. And so I wanted to present a sort of a sacred look at Newgrange, the sacred aspect of it, to go more in depth into. Uh, well, of course, I covered some of the information about uh, the the archaeology and the size and the nature of the site. Uh, and I did do that. So there's chapters early on. Uh, the second chapter is called Stone and Bone, which is to do with the fact that most of the materials were stone and bone, and that's what you dug the earth with. Uh, there's a chapter um, about community effort and how uh, people must have come together to build the monuments. A chapter called Sun, Moon and Stars, of course, which is about the astronomy. But chapter six is called The Test of Time, and I actually propose, Tracy is watching, Falcha Tracy, good evening to you. Uh, I propose to read actually a few chapters of the book uh, over different episodes. Um, I'm very interested in reading uh, a few uh, relating to the real sacred aspects. One of the sacred aspects, I think, of the great Brunabonia monuments is the fact that they are so enormous and that they are clearly, uh, uh, first of all, that you know the people who built them were at some sort of a creative zenith. Uh, the, there was... There must have been a unified community of people uh, who learned from the lessons of previous uh, constructions, the monuments in Sligo, the monuments in uh, Loch Crew, for example. Uh, and they really went all out on this one. Um, and it was as if this was a people who, had a, as I always call it, a cosmic vision that they saw the connection between the cycles of the heavens and the cycles of the earth. Uh, they worship the sun, of course, but they also worship the moon. And I'm sure that they study the stars and the planets and the movements thereof in great detail. Uh, and they saw the coming and going of the harvest and the coming and the going of growth and the coming and the growing of the death of winter and the dark days and the long days and the cold days and the warm days, the dry days and the rainy days. Um, and so, uh, given their meager status as people who are living fleeting lives, as we all do, and we're all on this earth for a short time, um, it seems to me that they tried to create uh, incredibly uh, long-lasting uh, memorials to their lives, uh, and just to their personal lives as an expression of ego. I think uh, as an expression of that struggle that we all have as humans, to deal with our mortality, uh, which lies at the heart of a lot of mythology and a lot of sacred and religious belief around the world uh, throughout the history of mankind, that we struggle basically to deal with the concept of shit, someday I'm going to die and I'm not going to be here anymore, you know? And it is, it is something that we just all have to face. Uh, it is faced, I believe, in primitive communities. We call them primitive. It's a terrible word. In, in, in pre-literate communities, it is faced uh, through their mythology and through their ritual practices and their religious beliefs. Uh, and it is, it is faced quite well and quite comprehensively. And perhaps that's something we're lacking today because we lack uh, that religious and sacred experience and that mythical experience. We find it much harder to deal with the crises as they arise. We are now in another crisis, by the way. Uh, the economy of Ireland and many other economies were doing very well. Thank you very much, having recovered from the disaster. And a lot of people will never recover from that disaster. And a lot of people will never go back to living in the houses that they were living in before and find their financial situation probably uh, much affected. Um, uh, but we're now in another crisis brought about by this pandemic. And if it teaches us one thing, it teaches us that crises come and go. Uh, mankind is by and large resilient. Uh, we have to at all times be hopeful. We have to at all times uh, acknowledge the past while looking to the future. Uh, and we also have to acknowledge our own frailty and the uh, temporal nature uh, of our own existences. So that's an introduction to the subject. And that is kind of why I wrote Newgrange Im Monument to Immortality. I felt that there was, if you'll excuse the commercial uh, language. I felt there was a market for it. Uh, and, uh, and those of you who know me very well uh, know that I've never been one who has sort of tried to make a living from my writing. Uh, I do it because I love it. 
uh, and I still work full time. Um, but this was a labor of love for me. And I think that there was something very important to be expressed, uh, and particularly at that moment in time. And it's often been said by scholars that, you know, a lot of what is written about ancient monuments and mythology reflects the uh, the zeitgeist or the, 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 the feelings and the motives and uh, the, the mood of the time they're written. And I think that's very true. And I don't deny that there is an aspect of that in this work. As I said, it's objective. Sorry, it is subjective. And uh, I would never try to claim that it is anything other than that. But then it is a subjective area for me because I am, as you probably know, uh, quite closely married to this place in terms of um, uh, I have this very, very deep raw, this deep love for the landscape in which I was born and in which I live. Uh, I hope to never leave it. Uh, I, I, I hope to be here in one form or another for a long time into the future. Um, I have no desire to leave the Boyne Valley and go somewhere else in the world. It, it, it is where my heart belongs. It, it, it is the place that has sung to me and spoke to me on so many levels. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this anyway. This is chapter six of Newgrange, Monument, Im Monument to Immortality, and it's called The Test of Time. The eternal rhythm of the cosmic cycles and the enduring continuance of the sky's patterns, repeating themselves over and over again across vast aeons of time, imbue the human watchers of the earth with a salient sense of the fleeting nature of corporeal life. We are here only for a short time. This gripping sense of the brevity of human life entangles us all at some stage. It is difficult to grow into adulthood without inevitably wondering what is going to happen to us. When will we die and how? These are the questions that puzzle us all and an understanding and recognition and even acceptance of physical death is something that bonds together all of humanity through all of the ages. It is likely that no generation has lived on this earth since the remote beginnings of humankind that hasn't wondered about the whole purpose of this life, which can be cruel and harsh and short. Many generations of people throughout Irish history and prehistory have lived and died and left no mark on the earth, no rem reminder of singular achievement, no memorial, to their labours and beliefs. When our time comes, what reminder will we leave behind? What great gift will we bequest to the earth as a reminder of the fact that we ever existed? The word memorial means something that is designed to preserve the memory of a person or a people or an event or happening. Many people have lived long lives and contributed much to their community, and the only memorial to their existence is a headstone. Many more, buried in countless relic graveyards across Ireland, are not even afforded such a luxury. Their dry bones lie in the ground, and the earth has forgotten who they were. They might not have existed at all. The same could easily have been said for the new, new Stone Age farmers of the Boyne Valley, except for the fact that they constructed some of the largest and the most enduring monuments of this island's history. Their vast shrines of stone and earth are grand memorials to lives spent toiling in honour of greater ideals. And take a sup of water. The people who built the passage mounds are gone from the earth, their time long over, their memory almost erased from the human story. But something of their spirit remains and something of their story can be pieced together. Their legacy, gifted to us modern folk across countless generations, comes in the form of stones and stories. By looking at these stones and by reading these stories, we can catch glimpses of distant lives lived in the hoary yesteryear. In a time when men and women had begun to leave their nomadic hunting lifestyles behind and had begun to declare their presence on the earth. Whatever the forces were that drove them to such memorable feats, they were likely many. The sheer scale of the effort involved, especially for a technologically primitive society is impressive. 
the hundreds of thousands of tons of stone and earth required for new grange and for the other large mounds were wrought into giant mounds that were so large that they could almost be described as hills. Indeed, one of the old Irish words which is sometimes used to describe a man-made mound or a tumulus is knuck, C-N-O-C, which also happens to be a word used to describe a hill. In the Metrical Dinshanachus, a collection of very old place name stories contained in the 12th century Book of Leinster and some of the later manuscripts, both Nouth and Douth are described as hills. Douth is described as, quote, the solid hill, unquote, while Nouth is equally described, Knuck ik boa i medon brae, which translates as a hill had boa in the midst of Breya. It was, if it was the desire of the Neolithic community of the Boyne to build enduring monuments, constructions that would stand the test of time, then certainly they chose wisely in their design plans. The erection of enormous mounds and cairns of stone on ridges and hilltops across Ireland in prehistory in large numbers is testament to the persistence and ingenuity of the builders. Archaeologists refer to Newgrange as a passage tomb, and it is estimated that there are over 300 passage tombs in Ireland. There are or were. However, there are many more mounds, cairns and moats which have been unexcavated, which might in the future be found to contain passage tombs. The total number of surviving megalithic tombs, if one also includes the court tombs, portal tombs and wedge tombs, is 1,500. Although wedge tombs date to the end of the Neolithic uh, after 2500 BC, uh, sort of at the threshold of the late Neolithic and the early Bronze Age. This is an astonishing number, especially when one considers the amount of vandalism and destruction of monuments that has taken place in Ireland during the past three centuries. Even large stone monuments were utterly destroyed, and we spoke about that, of course, in our episode, uh, 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 the soon-to-be-mentioned uh, epi the episode about Ireland Stonehenge. One such example is the so-called Ireland Stonehenge at Carnbeg outside Dundalk, County Loud. A series of concentric rings of stones and a large circular embankment of which no visible trace remains, except what has been revealed by specialist ground-probing archaeological techniques. Kelly, Kelly's message, I think, should be read out. Tomorrow is Memorial Day in the States. My beloved father passed away on Memorial Day, and when I brought his ashes with me to Drogheda, thanks to you and the ladies of Brunabonia, I was blessed to be let to put some of those ashes in the middle basin. They're dancing with us from heaven this weekend. Lovely, lovely stuff, Kelly. And, of course, Kelly Edmiston uh, and I uh, have had the fortune of meeting uh, Kelly, I remember you used to come into my workplace in Drogheda when I worked in Drogheda, and that's not yesterday. But anyway, it's, it's very good to see you. The quarrying of material from Newgrange, carried out by Charles Campbell at the end of the 17th century, was thankfully not extensive and not nearly as destructive as that which occurred at nearby Douth. Sir Thomas Pownall, who visited Newgrange in uh, 1769, seemed to believe that Newgrange was, quote, but a ruin of what it was, unquote, and that a large amount of material had been removed from in front of the entrance as from a stone quarry. Uh, Daniel, Danilo Paparello says, thanks, Anthony, uh, IZ1HVD, EI9HJB uh, from EI2KC, uh, us hams will, will know what that is, uh, 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 QSL Danilo, nice to see you. However, Professor O'Kelly gives us some comfort in the matter. This statement of Pownall's gave rise to the belief frequently expressed, even in modern times, that vast quantities of material had been removed. Undoubtedly, some amount of stone had been taken, but during the recent excavations, no evidence was found that wholesale removal of cairn material had taken place, such as uh, happened at Douth, for example. Uh, 
One wonders what moved Charles Campbell and his laborers to stop carrying off stones from Newgrange for the construction of his new mansion. Patricia Langton is watching, as is Gillian Gogarty. Uh, good evening to you both. At Douth, much larger quantities of stone were removed. Sir William Wilde, writing in 1847. W2HAT says Yvette. Is that another? Uh, my dad, he has passed. Oh, okay. There's a few of us around the place. Uh, I, I said one of the most, I was asked by James there recently on his live stream uh, last Sunday. Um, just that's a week ago already. He says, what useless talent do you have? I said, I can send and receive Morse code. William Wilde, writing in 1847, says, a considerable gap occurs in the western face of the mound. He's talking about doubt. Caused by large quantities of the stones of which it is composed, having been removed at different times to erect buildings or to break up into macadamizing material for the road which passes at its foot. It has been said, we hope without truth, that the grand jury of the county have, in form, present, presented for the stones to doubt, of doubt to improve the condition of the roads. It is a firm testament to the labourers, sorry, the labours of the builders of doubt that such a large quantity of material could be removed from the cairn, and yet such a great deal of it still exists. There is today a very large crater in the top of the mound, sadly the result of an invasive and destructive excavation carried out by R.H. Frith at the behest of the Committee of Antiquities of the Royal Irish Academy in 1847-8. to I think I mentioned this before. Unfortunately, in my Newgrange book, uh, I referred to this gentleman as Firth, F-I-R-T-H, which was a mistake by me. His name is Frith, F-R-I-T-H, uh, and unfortunately I spelt it as Firth, uh, and it was not corrected in the reprint because I didn't notice it until after that. Uh, slight error, totally my fault, mea culpa. It is interesting to note that in the middle of the Great Famine, during which a million Irish people died and another million emigrated, the esteemed gentlemen of the privileged class had nothing better to occupy their thoughts than an ill-conceived and unsuccessful treasure hunt at Douth, for which a special subscription fund had to be raised, while the population was suffering one of the worst calamities in Irish history. The efforts of the archaeologists, and I had to put that in uh, inverted commas, Sorry, I've lost my place now. Uh, the efforts of the archaeologists were eventually abandoned when they failed to find a central chamber which they believed might have been found under the cairn. The absence of this chamber, quote, probably convinced the committee that Douth was a monument of little importance after all, unquote. For this, we must be grateful, for a continuance of this butchery, even for another season, might have flattened the cairn completely and no effort was made to restore the monument to its previous condition. Reverend James Graves of the Archaeological Association of Ireland, and I do think that is quite an ironic name uh, for somebody who's, who deals with, with old uh, uh, monuments uh, to be called Graves, uh, of the Archaeological Association of Ireland, writing in 1879, so that's uh, uh, a few decades after the, the, uh, the excavation, and I uh, put excavation in quote marks as well, says... We must lament that this grand national monument has been left to destruction. It would also be well to remark that the, quote, archaeological society, unquote, which devastated the tumulus was not our association. It was explored about 30 years ago by private individuals. No account of the exploration has ever been published, and when I saw it, the materials of the tumulus were lying about in sad confusion and evidently had never been placed back. Being so, Mr. Elcock, the tenant of the land, naturally thought they would form good building materials and acted accordingly. Thousands of tons of stones for road metal were also taken from it, for Mr. Elcock was a road contractor as well as a house builder. Thankfully, Newgrange was spared the gross vandalism suffered at Douth. After the discovery of the passage entrance by Campbell's labourers in 1699, the Welsh antiquarian Edward Cloyd visited and took, quote, took careful note 
of all that was to be seen and heard, unquote. Perhaps it was the arrival of such a luminary as Cloyd that convinced Campbell of the importance of the site and thus prevented further destruction. This did not prevent Cloyd from describing Campbell as a, quote, gentleman of the village who had employed his servants to rob stone from the tomb at Newgrange, unquote. Jennifer Ho, I must away, but good on you for great book. Uh, uh, good, e good evening, Sloan Jennifer, Sloan Gafol. Newgrange did not suffer from human intervention and alteration to the extent that its sister sites did. At Nouth, for instance, there are several phases of activity during which considerable alterations to various parts of the structure were undertaken. These included the creation of an enormous ditch behind the curbstones during the Iron Age, the building of souterrains, underground passageways dating from the early Christian period, and the fortification of the mound in medieval times. One result of these destructive later phases of human activity at Nouth was the foreshortening of the passageways, which had suffered early Christian remodeling. If anything, uh, and, 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 and just, to, just to clarify, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean uh, uh, the remodeling uh, was done by early Christians. Uh, the early medieval period used to be called in archaeology the early Christian period. There's now uh, uh, there's a more secular description of it now, as it were, uh, which is the early medieval period. If anything, most of the serious damage that took place at Newgrange occurred naturally and long before the days of Charles Campbell, as Frank Frank Prendergast of Dublin Institute of Technology explains. For reasons unknown, the cairn underwent a catastrophic collapse sometime during the Bronze Age, causing an outward slip of stones and boulders. This slip reached as far as the Great Circle in front of the passage entrance and completely covered the Great Circle to the east and west, where it runs nearest the cairn. The slip completely concealed the curb and sealed the entrance. The Great Circle, referred to by Prendergast, is the ring of standing stones around Newgrange, of which 12 survive. With the exception of one of these great stones, there was no significant displacement caused by the collapse of material from the main cairn. Something that I didn't discuss in the Newgrange book in 2012, uh, which I, I would like to discuss at some point in the future, is the possibility, uh, uh, quite a plausible possibility, that the Cairn material was purposefully collapsed and kicked out or pushed out uh, to bury the curb and bury the site uh, and not, you know, uh, just so that it was to remain hidden and sealed, you know. The great circle referred to by Prender, sorry, uh, I said that. The remodeling that took place at both Nouth and Douth in later times did not occur at Newgrange. Professor O'Kelly wrote that although it was not possible to specify the time frame in which the sides of the Newgrange Cairn slipped outwards over the curb. Quote, it is at least possible to say that no secondary interments or any modifications of the structure, such as occurred at many chambered tombs, were discovered here. Unquote. O'Kelly points out that it is not known whether the collapse of the cairn and the concealing of the entrance led to the abandonment of Newgrange at that time, or whether it had already been abandoned when the collapse occurred. The quartz and granite stones, which were found in a layer at the bottom of the cairn slip at the front of the mound, had, quote, come down in a fairly rapid and clean collapse, unquote, according to O'Kelly. This was followed sometime later by a sudden great slide of stones, the cause of which is unknown. He speculates that it could have been brought about by a sudden thaw after a severe frost or perhaps even an earth tremor. And to be honest, I think that because of the uniformity of the cairn uh, covering the curb in its entirety, uh, one would have to favor the uh, notion uh, of human interference in uh, or uh, human involvement in the collapse of the cairn material. The collapse of the cairn material covered over the curb stones and blocked up the entrance, and the general profile of the cairn remained the same from that time, in other words, the Bronze Age, until Charles Campbell's disturbances in 1699 when the entrance was rediscovered. In 
In other words, Newgrange lay concealed, its secrets hidden for the best part of 4,000 years. The concealment of the curb stones beneath the mound slip material resulted in the inadvertent protection of these stones that had carvings on them. The blocking up of the tomb entrance meant that whatever bones and other material were contained in the interior were not disturbed or removed by visitors or intruders, at least until Campbell's time. A steady stream of visitors and explorers after 1699 probably caused severe disturbance of bone remains and any burial goods and artefacts that might have been inside. By the time of O'Kelly's excavations, there were only bone remains from five individuals found in the interior. The discovery of the chamber allowed people to, quote, trample the ground of both passage and chamber ever, ever since, probably removing or destroying any small artefacts which might have survived from the Stone Age, unquote. Terry Steiner is watching. Hi, Terry. Good evening. Anthony, do we know why they decommissioned these monuments, says Aaron? <laughs> no. It's that it's not that we don't. You could speculate, and that would open up a discussion. Um, but I mean, can we know? Uh, you know, uh, can we know why they built the thing in the first place? You know, it's a good question, uh, but I'm not going to try and answer it right now. Uh, it's something we might deal with in a future episode. Despite the collapse of material over the edge of the cairn, the actual height of New Grange is not thought to have changed much since it was constructed. This can be taken as a vindication of the design, which not only kept the structure of the interior chamber intact for five millennia, but which also kept it largely dry for most of that time. Faced with the design and engineering of monuments, which were to be used for many purposes, including the placement of the bones of the dead for astronomical observations, and perhaps even to aid the journey of the spirits of the deceased into the next world, the question begs as to why the designers of Newgrange Nowth and Douth went to such great lengths to ensure the durability of these huge structures. If you wanted to build something that would tolerate the ravages of time and weather and nature, what better structure could you choose than a miniature hill? Apart from any gradual settling of material and perhaps some subsidence has happened at Newgrange, it would take forces of mighty proportions or certainly a great human effort to undo such a grand work. Newgrange, Nowth and Douth mark the zenith of the Irish megalithic culture. They're the largest and most lavishly designed of all the passage tombs. One question which arises time and again is whether or not durability was a key aspect of their design. In other words, were they created with the intention that they would survive long into the future? Certainly some archaeologists think so. Matthew and Geraldine Stout, who have carried out excavations in the Boyne Valley and have been studying Newgrange for the past two decades, suggests so. One of the marvels of the construction of the passage tomb within the cairn is that it remained basically intact and almost completely waterproof to this day. It was, in other words, built not for a generation, but for all time. Archaeologist Dr Carlton Jones of the National University of Ireland, Galway, says... Megalithic tombs endure. They are still here today for us to marvel at. Long after just about everything else Neolithic people made has either disappeared or lies buried and unseen. The mounds represent a permanent presence in an ever-changing landscape, a lasting memorial to the zeal and toil of an extraordinary community. The stones and the tombs which they form endure unchanged against the changing seasons and the passing generations. And this permanence was probably one aspect that appealed to the Neolithic builders. The stones and therefore the tombs were good symbols of ancient origins, ancestral lineages and timeless traditions. And uh, that's footnote number 26. Who is that quoted from? Is that still Carlton Jones or is it someone else? Yes, it's still Carlton Jones from Temples of Stone, exploring the megalithic tombs of Ireland, the Collins Press, 2007. There is no doubt this symbolism is part of the appeal of Newgrange today. Irish people and descendants of the Irish from abroad, mostly from the United States, come here in search of some arcane connection with forgotten ancestors, cherished forebears. And the journey to Newgrange represents a pilgrimage of sorts, a bonding of human spirits across thousands of years. This great shrine, this temple of stone and earth, ingenious, ingeniously fashioned, 
by bright men and women of the distant yesteryear, stands today as a sanctuary for the human spirit, for the lost ancestors of the hoary past, and for the modern day pilgrim who comes here to commune with them. Newgrange endures more than 5,000 years after it was built, and with its survival, the memory of the ancestors also endures, for this great monument was a product of their spiritual and scientific endeavours, grafted in stone and earth as an everlasting memorial to their brief time on this planet. There is an old poem about Newgrange, which was uttered to Fionn McCool by a poet who put him under a spell so that he could understand it. I saw a house in the country, out of which no hostages are given to a king. Fire burns it not, harrying spoils it not. Good the prosperity with which it was conceived, the kingly house. Uh, Liz Curry asks a brilliant question. Anthony, if you could ask the builders of Newgrange one question, what would it be? Just one. Why and how did you do it? That's one question, you know? <laughs> oh, my God, there's so many questions, you know? Um, I'd ask them to read my book, uh, my books and then say, are, 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 am I right or am I wrong? <laughs> uh, very interesting question. I'd like to ask them a whole series of questions, to be honest. Finn indicates that he understands the meaning of the verse, saying that Newgrange, quote, cannot be burned or harried so long as Angus still lives, unquote. Newgrange survives today, and its perpetual endurance might signify in some people's minds that the spirit of Angus, and perhaps also of the people who built it, lives on. Fascinatingly, there might be some cosmology underlying the need for Newgrange to survive into the modern age, which we will explore in chapter 14. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, somebody has announced that they, they bought, uh, they've, they've bought the, the book online as I've been speaking. So you'll get to read chapter 14 before everyone else, unless, of course, some of you already have it. The passage mounds are in stark contrast with whatever homes the builders lived in. Of these, little trace has yet been found in the Boyne Valley. Evidence from excavations at Nauth shows that rectangular houses were being built around 3800 BC, but apart from their early Neolithic houses. But apart from these examples, the homes of the builders have, quote, largely managed to elude us, unquote. The Nauth houses, like other rectangular Neolithic dwellings, were constructed using upright wooden posts. One of the dwellings found at Nauth had been partially built over when the main mound was constructed, and it is possible that the Nauth dwellings do not belong to the same people who were responsible for building the passage tombs. Excuse me. But what is clear is that the homes of the Neolithic are fleeting, almost temporary structures in comparison with the great mounds and cairns which survived for millennia. Ephemeral homes, says Megan Walters. Yes, exactly. Ephemeral homes and enduring temples. No greater contrast could be imagined. Sorry, whose words are these? I have to find out. I have to find out before I read them. It's only fair that we should say whose words these are. If they're not mine, they're someone else's. And this is from uh, Peter Harbison. No greater contrast could be imagined than that between these meagre rectangular houses and the curving curve and circumference of the massive stone-built mounds that, co <coughs> that constitute the three great passage tomb cemeteries of Douth, Nauth, and Newgrange. We may be able to tell a lot more, these are my words, about the builders, about how the builders lived, if and when we find their dwellings. There are lots of unanswered questions about the builders of Newgrange, and this is one aspect of the mystery surrounding who they really were. Will archaeologists someday find evidence of a massive cluster of homes in one particular field in the Boyne Valley, indications of village living, or will they find homes scattered here and there throughout the valley? To sustain the level of construction that took place in the valley during a concentrated period lasting perhaps a couple of centuries, a substantial settlement such as that indicated by Connor Brady's Plowzone finds would have been necessary. 
where was this substantial settlement? We don't yet know. And intriguingly, in the images that myself and Ken Williams captured during the drought of 2018, uh, when we discovered Drone Henge, there is another series of features in that field called the pit complex, which may be signs of just such village life. But of course, uh, until such time as we actually do a dig, we're unlikely to be able to tell for sure. Another mystery surrounds the burial practices of the mound building community. Even with all the disturbance inside Newgrange, after the time of Campbell's discovery of the chamber, it is, it is unlikely that bone remains from the entire community had been placed within and that these have been carted off over the past few centuries. Even in that scenario, Professor O'Kelly should have found the bones of several dozen individuals. Were the ordinary labourers and farmers of the Bend of the Boyne buried in the smaller tombs in the valley or were they buried somewhere else? We will explore the matter of the extent of the role of burial at Newgrange in the next chapter. A further aspect of the survival of Newgrange relates to the common folk belief that damaging or vandalising an ancient site would result in revenge by the fairy folk. The fairies were known as the Dina Shi, the people of the mound, and they preferred, quote, to live underground, especially under a hill, in a cave or burrow, or in a heap of stones such as the rats of Ireland, unquote. Although fairy lore only appears within the last millennium, the enduring tradition of such folklore suggests that the she, the fairy mounds, were considered the places, quote, where the semi-divine Tua de Danon fled underground after their defeat by the mortal Milesians, unquote. And of course, we are going to have an episode in the near future dealing with the emergence of the fairy uh, beliefs out of belief in the, pre, uh, in the pre-Christian deities. Essentially, the fairy folk are, quote, composed of the discarded gods and diminished heroes of the old native religion, unquote, as one theory of the origin of fairy faiths suggests. As a renowned palace of the gods, Newgrange Schiedenbroga would have held particular reverence. Its association with some of the supreme deities of the Tua de Danon probably resulted in a fastidious observation of a no trespassing rule of sorts, which resulted in many prehistoric monuments around Ireland being protected from damage over the centuries. Sadly, not in the case of Ireland's Stonehenge and many of the great monuments around Dundalk, but of course that damage was wrought uh, by uh, foreign tenants and landowners. Rural dwellers in particular held fast to deep superstitions about the possible outcomes of damaging rats and mounds and stone circles. A common tale to be heard at various ancient sites around Ireland akin to a modern urban myth, tells of how a particular farmer starts breaking up stones from a cairn or mound, only to be informed within a short time of his vandalism that a member of his family has died in a tragedy such as a drowning. This persistent and widespread folklore held that any damage to a fairy mound might result in a catastrophe for the vandal. And as a result of this, many farmers, even today, won't go anywhere near sacred mounds of ancient sites on their or ancient sites on their lands. Uh, it has to be said that hasn't prevented a huge number of monuments from being wiped from the face of the earth uh, over the past couple of centuries. It was not unknown in the 19th century for roads to be rerouted around fairy mounds. And, quote, the she was not to be disturbed by grazing cattle, and most farmers would avoid both the she and perceived paths to and from it, unquote. The special reverence surrounding Newgrange likely shielded it from that, from the sort of reuse that had occurred at Nouth and Douth. Uh, around Dundalk, uh, briefly, Maura Campbell, there were a lot of document, uh, uh, monuments documented by Thomas Wright in the 1740s in Lothiana, uh, Druids Grove, stone circles, mounds, standing stones, etc., all wiped off uh, Carrick Edmund, uh, Killen Hill, uh, and what is that, Bal Balrigan? Is it the one with the motorway uh, passes through? The special reverence surrounding Newgrange likely shielded it from the sort of reuse that had occurred at Nouth and Douth, but it did not altogether escape damage. A number of the great circle stones had been removed before the coming of the Romans, although it was not known when this vandalism took place. In the 12th century, Newgrange and the lands around it fell into the ownership of the Cistercians who had founded the nearby Mellifont Abbey in 1142. The sprawling estate of the Cistercians constituted 20,000 hectares, which was divided into smaller farms known as granges. 
And it was at this time that the ancient name of Brew passed out of general use in favor of Newgrange. Uh, and Newgrange, as I've told you in previous episodes, is a 12th century name and not its ancient name, which is why you will never see Newgrange uh, mentioned in, uh, in old Irish mythology. Intense ridge and furrow cultivation at this time is thought to have played a part in the destruction of at least one smaller passage tomb near Newgrange, and it is possible other sites were damaged during this period. The Cistercians might not have concerned themselves too much with the supposed reverence associated with Newgrange. One cannot imagine the hard-nosed Cistercian farmers paying much heed to pagan legends. And so we encounter one of those occasional reports uh, of uh, interference, uh, possible interference with sites uh, by uh, by those uh, uh, pertaining to uh, Christianity. Uh, but of course, as I've said before, most of the damage, unfortunately, was carried out in recent, uh, the past couple of centuries, and mostly by landowners and tenants and careless farmers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One of the most ironic, I'm talking about in general across Ireland, I'm not talking specifically about Brunabonia. One of the most ironic results of the passing of Newgrange into the hands of the Cistercians was that, while it lost its old name, it gained the name by which we all know it today. By 1378, the mound had been completely stripped of its former identity and was called merely the Newgrange. One folk epithet of Newgrange is Uav Nagrenye, the Cave of the Sun. The endurance of descriptions which may refer to the gleaming white quartz of Newgrange is also fascinating, especially in light of the Cairn Collapse, which appears to have resulted in much of this milky white stone being buried and hidden from view. Archaeologist Claire O'Kelly, wife of Professor Michael O'Kelly, said, It is tempting to see in such phrases as mock on oaks brew, brilliant to approach, comma, yonder brew checkered with the many lights, and the white-topped brew of the Boyne, references to the glistening white quartz of the Newgrange Mound. Interestingly, the word checkered is translated from brex, brecholos, from brec and solus, meaning speckled and light. In Ireland of the setting sun, it was suggested that the milky quartz which adorned the monument might have been considered, quote, a sanctified reflection of the Milky Way, unquote. At the time Newgrange was built, Milky Way galaxy would have been seen to settle along the horizon in a complete loop, something which does not happen today. Of significance is the fact that the river Boyne, the river of the White Cow, which is the earthly Milky Way, the way of the White Cow, also loops around Newgrange on three sides. It says sites here. That's a spell. That's, that's a typo. I've spotted a typo in my own book. Who, who was proofreading this? on three sides to the east, south, and west, that is on pretty much the same sides of the monument as the quartz. These epithets of Newgrange do refer to the quartz. It is, sorry, if these epithets of Newgrange do refer to the quartz, it is possible that they are memories of Newgrange as it appeared before the Bronze Age Cairn collapse. Professor O'Kelly found the quartz layer at the very bottom of the cairn slip material, which means a great deal of this quartz, if not all of it, was hidden from view for four millennia. Perhaps there was originally an entire covering of quartz over the mound, and this was gradually taken away over time, perhaps piece by piece as keepsakes by visitors to the site. And that happened at Loch Crewe, actually. This seems unlikely, though, especially in light of the aforementioned fairy folklore, which would have forbidden any interference with the mound. And, and just one slight aside on that, I'm not sure if I'd mentioned it before, uh, but once upon a time, the good people of the OPW who run uh, the Brunabonia Visitor Centre uh, received a large box in the mail, uh, and inside the box was a package with a note wrapped around it. Uh, uh, and basically, to, to make a, a short story long, uh, or a long story short, um, there was a block of quartz, a piece of quartz wrapped up in the in the in the note, and the note said something along the lines of, "Hello, I'm from, I think he was American. Uh, I visited Newgrange a number of years ago, and I took this piece of quartz from the monument as a souvenir of my visit, and I've had nothing but rotten luck ever since." and I want you to have it back, and he posted it back to them in a box. There you go. Newgrange has largely stood the test of time, however unlikely that may seem. 
By fortunate happenstance, its cairn material suffered a partial collapse not long after it was built, which helped to seal off the curb stones and the chamber for 4,000 years. As a revered palace of the gods, it was bestowed with a greater superstitious and spiritual aura than many other sites and was, fortunately, left alone throughout the long years of prehistory and historic times, almost untouched by human hands. Its remarkable state of preservation into the modern age is due to a combination of its ingenious construction and a mix of fortune and fairy tales. For that, we are extremely grateful. We have inherited a temple, a shrine, a tomb, a monument of remote ancestors, which stands today as an everlasting memorial to their accomplishments. And that is chapter six uh, from Newgrange Monument to Immortality, the test of time. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I'll read uh, probably a couple more chapters uh, uh, in the coming week. Um, you'll, 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 you'll know that uh, if you have read Mythical Ireland, you'll know that uh, probably the most substantial uh, section of Mythical Ireland is the first section, which has eight chapters, eight chapters dealing with Newgrange. They're not all very long chapters, but um, uh, I, I, Mythical Ireland gave me a, an opportunity to continue the, the work. I'm pretty sure, and I have to say this, I have to sort of, Sort of in in total honesty, uh, total disclosure, full disclosure, I have to say that I see mistakes and errors and and, and uh, omissions in my my earlier work. I failed to mention in that chapter, for instance, uh, those passages in the Annals of Ulster and the Annals of the Four Masters that that mention that the cave of Acho Aldi and Knogba and Duod and Drogheda were were raided by the Vikings in, in a eight. Uh, 61 or 863 AD, depending on which annals you read. And that, that leaves one wondering what did what did they plunder at Newgrange if Newgrange is Acho Aldi, and that's the only mention of it uh, as Acho Aldi that we've ever come across. Uh, there were no souterrains found at Newgrange, interestingly, but there are souterrains at Nowth and at Douth. Um, uh, and perhaps uh, it has been suggested that perhaps the, the caves that were raided were the souterrains, but Matthew Stout has pointed out that the souterrains at, at Nowth were built after the alleged incursion by uh, the Vikings a few years afterwards. Um, yeah, so that is, you can see how it combines the sacred with the data. I didn't want to write another book that was just about the data and, and about the material and about because it, although that is all fascinating, of course, and is absolutely essential to the um, to the exploration of New Range, there was this extra sacred aspect to it that had to be uh, included. Uh, so anyway, uh, if you've enjoyed that, I don't have any copies. Uh, there's a note on the Mythical Ireland website saying that I ran out of copies, and the only reason I haven't been able to get copies of New Range and Monument, or sorry, and Mythical Ireland. Uh, are because I'm I'm restricted to five kilometres. I have to go to the uh, publisher in Dublin or to the distributor's warehouse in Dublin. Uh, I'm not sure if that's even open, actually, uh, to get more copies. And we're not allowed to do that at the moment. When the restrictions are lifted in, later in June on the 18th, uh, I'll probably be able to meet my publisher somewhere in the middle, and uh, he'll give me copies of Newgrange and Mythical Ireland. Uh, and I'll have more copies available. So if you if you want to order from me and sign copies, I can't do that right now because I don't have any copies. Uh, if you want to buy buy them on Amazon or on uh, Barnes and Noble or wherever, uh, by all means do. But if you want a signed copy, uh, obviously you'd be ordering them through my website. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, thank you at the end of the week uh, and at the end of episode seventy four. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed the exploration. It's been a constant learning experience for me. I've uh, just seen the expansion of the Tua and the lovely interaction between you all. And I think the birth of uh, many other creative uh, projects uh, around this whole thing. Um, and uh, I'm very glad for all of your suggestions. Um, in terms of uh, episodes. Some of those will be easy to do, some of them less easy. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best uh, to get round to um, 
all of your suggestions at some point. But more to come, and definitely in the coming week, uh, there'll be a bit of a focus on Newgrange. We have to talk about the reconstruction, uh, and we have to talk about the mythology of Newgrange, and separately we'll be reading Altrum Chia Ga Ga Vether, which is the house of the fostering of the two drinking vessels, which is a very important myth about uh, Newgrange. We've already done, uh, of course, Toch Mark uh, In the meantime, I hope you're all in good form, safe and well. Have a very good day wherever you are in the world. If you're in Ireland or in Britain or in Europe, a very good evening to you and a very good night to you. If you're in the States, have a great day. If you're in Australia, it's tomorrow morning and have a good Monday. Uh, we'll see you all uh, in Australia. We'll see you later today. Every, everyone else will see you tomorrow evening at the same time, 8 p.m. for episode 75. I usually announce the theme of the episode in the middle of the day. Once again, thanks to Margaret Ring for helping me out of a bind today when I was trying to decide what to talk about. Uh, and uh, I think it was an inspired cho choice, uh, Margaret, and, and maybe uh, fitted the, uh, the the mood of the evening for everyone. Patreon link. Yes, Tracy has reminded me. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, uh, I, my thanks, as always, to Coda for barking when I try to talk. <laughs> My thanks, as always, to the patrons uh, of Mythical Ireland for your support. Uh, and it is it is very great, gratefully received. Uh, and you support uh, the things that happen. Uh, you support the website, uh, and uh, that requires a certain amount of uh, investment, shall we say. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a patron, uh, the link is patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com and forward slash Mythical Ireland. And I'm going to po post that as a comment here beneath the YouTube video and beneath the Facebook live video. You'll see it coming up there as a comment. And of course, there's absolutely no pressure on anybody to become a patron. Uh, and I will continue to do li live myths. Uh, I don't know. I'll keep going. I'm just, I just—I haven't even questioned, asked myself about, uh, will you go to 100? Will you go to 150 or what? I haven't thought about that. At some point, I think this series will have reached its natural conclusion. And I don't feel that we've reached that yet. And in fact, I don't think we're even close to it yet. Uh, so I'm going to keep going uh, for the time being. Um, but anyway, maybe you might want to check out Patreon. In the meantime, it's been great having you all. I love to see the interaction. Don't forget, if you're not already a member of the Mythical Ireland community on um, Facebook, that is a separate Facebook page to this one. This this one that you're watching on uh, the Facebookers uh, is uh, a, a page that only I can post on. You can reply to my posts, but you can't post things yourself. Mythical Ireland community is much more sort of an interactive space uh, where uh, people can come together. And there's been a lovely sharing lately uh, of stories and videos and artworks. Uh, and it's just a lovely community in general. There is no trolling. There's no ba bad behavior. People are nice to each other. And it's been a nice safe place for people to be during the lockdown and during the uncertainty of the COVID pandemic. And speaking of, for tonight, uh, to say, as I always say at the end of the episode, make sure that you keep washing your hands regularly, maintain your social distancing. In Ireland, it's two metres. I'm not sure what it is everywhere else. Everywhere else. Uh, only make trips to the supermarkets, etc., etc. when you need to. Try not to be around too many people. And if you're outdoors, and especially if you're indoors, in amongst people, wear a face mask. It is recommended. It's not obligatory in a lot of countries. It's not obligatory in Ireland, but it's recommended. Stay safe and stay healthy so that you can keep coming back every day uh, and enjoying the no troll zone, as Neil calls it. In the meantime, call us off on the Slonga Fowl. We'll see you tomorrow at a hocht a clug at eight o'clock in the evening. Movanacht Orev Gulair. And thank you, YouTubers. We'll see you again tomorrow evening. Call us off. Good evening. Hello. Welcome.